Good morning. Um, my name is Marcy Basinger, and um, together with my partner, Peggy Graham, uh, we are going to be talking to you today about legal and financial planning. Um, Peggy and I are partners at Pregenzer Basinger Weidman and Sale. We are a law firm that specializes in estate planning, probate, elder law, guardianship and conservatorship, trust and estate litigation, um, several other legal issues. But one of the primary uh, focuses of our practice is advanced planning for people um, who have disabilities or who have maybe a, a new diagnosis of a cognitive um, impairment or some kind of condition that um, requires advanced planning. Um, to be uh, totally honest, everyone um, uh, should engage in advanced planning. Everyone should be thinking about the legal, financial, business um, affairs of their life and who can help them with those affairs if something might um, happen with to them where they would be unable to take care of those things for themselves. Um, Denise, if you would move us to slide number two. Um, the, this slide just tells you some of the things that we would like to talk about today that we would like to share with you based on our experience um, practicing in this very important field. Um, and along the way, if you have questions, please let us know. We'll try to save some time at the end to go over any questions that you might have. Um, Denise, I think if we could skip the, the next couple of slides that are videos and then go to slide number five. Um, and let me just talk for a moment about what advanced planning really means. Um, ad advanced planning is a way to try to anticipate what um, legal, financial, business um, issues might develop in the future that um, an individual may not be able to handle themselves because of some sort of cognitive uh, problem. So we're all, uh, you know, in this caregivers conference, one of the common ties here is that we are all concerned about um, ourselves or a loved one who may have a recent diagnosis of a cognitive impairment some sort of condition that is going to, or has already led to a cognitive impairment, um, or we may be concerned about that for ourselves. And so looking ahead, we want to think about what issues may arrive in, arise in the future and who can help us through those issues if we're unable to do that for, um, for ourselves. As estate planning lawyers and as elder law attorneys, um, Peggy and I um, work with clients all the time on a regular basis to address these kinds of issues. Um, we have several tools in our toolbox to discuss with people and to help people plan ahead. Um, and whether that may be um, getting their legal affairs in order, or anticipating what care what their care needs might be, or anticipating how that is going to be paid for. Those are all um, of the issues that we are addressing with our clients on nearly a daily basis. Uh, Denise, if you go to slide number six. Um, so what we're going to talk about today, primarily, um, I would just say that this is a pretty vast topic and we can go on for hours and hours, but we're limited in time. So what we're going to focus on today are powers of attorney. And then um, Peggy's gonna talk to you a little later in the program about guardianship and conservatorship. There are, like I said, a number of tools in our toolbox, but though we're gonna focus on those topics today because I think they may be the most um, popular topics that we as elder law attorneys and estate planners talk about. So I'm gonna focus for a few minutes here on powers of attorney. What I wanna start talking about first is, what is a power of attorney? A power of attorney is a legal document um, where um, someone signs the document, they are called the principal, they are appointing someone called an agent 
who they are giving authority over specific financial or legal affairs. They are allowing that agent to do things for them that they could do for themselves. Um, our state statute really describes three different kinds of powers of attorney, a general power of attorney, which usually authorizes an agent to act for the principal um, for financial, property, legal, or business decisions, a healthcare power of attorney, which authorizes the agent to make medical treatment decisions or personal sort of decisions for the principal, or a mental health power of attorney, which authorizes the agent to make mental health treatment decisions for the principal. We're not going to talk very much today at all about the mental health power of attorney. If you have questions about that, we can cover that. But I think that the uh, general power of attorney and the healthcare power of attorney are really more um, germane to our discussion today. We talk a lot about powers of attorney being durable. Uh, we talk about durable powers of attorney. The word durable means that the power of attorney remains effective even if or even when the principal becomes incapacitated. When the principal signs the power of attorney, we are assuming, we are presuming that they are competent and able to sign legal documents. And I will talk about that capacity issue in just a few minutes. Um, but the durable nature of a power of attorney means that throughout the, um, throughout the duration of the power of attorney it remains effective, whether the, the principal is incapacitated or not. So that's what durable means. It doesn't become invalid because the principal has become incapacitated as long as the power of attorney itself says that it is durable in nature and powers of attorney are presumed to be durable in nature unless they specifically say otherwise. Um, Denise, if you'll switch to, uh, yeah, I think we're on the right slide, that's fine. Um, there is another important component of powers of attorney, which has to do with when the power of attorney becomes effective. Some powers of attorney are called springing. What, what springing means is that even though I may be signing a power of attorney today, if my power of attorney says that it is springing in nature, then that means that it doesn't become effective until I am incapacitated. It doesn't spring into effect until I'm incapacitated. I think when we first hear about that, we think, well, that's probably a good idea. I don't need a power of attorney if I am competent. But there are a number of concerns with those springing powers of attorney, and so they're, they're not my preference. I prefer powers of attorney to become effective immediately upon signing the power of attorney. And the reason that is my preference is because of, is for several reasons. Number one, if I sign a power of attorney today and I say that my power of attorney is effective today and it's going to remain effective throughout my life because it's durable in nature, then my agent can act for me, can transact business for me, can sign documents for me, can write checks for me, can do any number of things that I've authorized my agent to do, whether or not I am incapacitated. I might be overseas and unable to um, go to the bank and transact some kind of business. I'm, I am competent. I'm just not able to physically um, handle that piece of business that I need help with. If I have a springing power of attorney, my power of attorney has not gone into effect because I'm not incapacitated. So my agent has no authority or power to go transact that little discrete piece of business that I need taken care of. So in that illustration, a springing power of attorney is not effective and not helpful to the, to the principal. Another issue that arises with springing powers of attorney is, um, is when there has been a sudden event that has uh, caused someone to be incapacitated. When we have a springing power of attorney, 
the terms of the power, uh, power of attorney generally say, um, this power of attorney shall not become effective until I am determined to be incapacitated. Well, that decision, that determination of incapacity needs to be made by a healthcare provider. So, and, and a bank or a real estate company or a title company, they will not allow the agent to transact business for the principal unless there is some sort of proof that the principal is incapacitated. And so then the agent, in order to act on behalf of the principal, needs to go out and get that proof, needs to have documentation that the principal is now incapacitated. That's not always an easy thing to do. Um, finding a doctor who will, will see the principal, who will determine that the principal is incapacitated, who will write some kind of letter or provide some sort of report, that process could take days or weeks. And if there is some piece of business that the principal needs to transact and the agent needs to be able to do that for the principal, we've really put um, an extra layer of complication and, um, and stress on the agent to go out and get that proof and allow the agent to do something on behalf of the principal. So for those reasons, I really, um, prefer that powers of attorney become effective immediately. Um, we'll talk a little bit later on in the presentation about how to make sure that um, when you're, you know, how to make sure that your agent doesn't abuse that authority because your power of attorney is effective immediately. Um, I, if you will, you're, you're on slide eight, which is what I would, um, where I want us to be. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about healthcare powers of attorney and advanced directives. Uh, an advanced directive is a document or is language within a document that uh, tells our doctors and tells our healthcare providers and tells our family members what sort of treatment we want when we are at the end of our life. Do we want heroic measures employed until the very end? Do we prefer not to have heroic measures and we would rather just be made comfortable? Um, those are very personal, very difficult decisions to make and they should be made by us. Um, and so we need to do that ahead of time. We need to think about what we want as individuals and how we want to be treated. And we need to tell people because we may not be in a position where we can tell our healthcare providers or our families that we would like to stop treatment and we would like to just be made comfortable. Or we may not be able to tell our healthcare providers or our, or our family members that we want them to employ whatever treatment modalities are available until the very end. So those wishes that are very personal and very important need to be in writing. We need to let people know about that um, in our practice, what we prefer is that the advanced directive language be in a healthcare power of attorney, be, in, be contained within that document. A healthcare power of attorney um, appoints a healthcare agent, and the healthcare agent can make medical treatment decisions for the principal, can make decisions about residential placement if that becomes necessary or can make decisions about what sort of caregiving measures need to be employed. A healthcare power of attorney should also um, include language about uh, HIPAA and confidentiality release so that the agent does have the ability to communicate with the principal's doctors, uh, to communicate on behalf of the principal, to uh, obtain medical records for the principals. So we want that healthcare power of attorney to include all of that information as well as the principal's wishes <clears throat> um, in terms of their advanced directive. Uh, in that way, the agent doesn't have to guess about what the principal wants at the end of life. The agent knows because it's within that healthcare power of attorney document. We do have a statute in New Mexico that allows doctors to speak to various family members if a patient doesn't have 
um, a healthcare power of attorney in place. And what that statute does is really give doctors uh, or other healthcare providers sort of a list in priority fashion of who they can go to to obtain consent for a medical procedure if the patient is unable to give informed consent. So that's a nice sort of safety net for a patient, but it doesn't replace um, a healthcare power of attorney or it shouldn't replace a healthcare power of attorney. It's really a safety net to allow doctors to go to someone and, and get medical consent in sort of an emergency um, setting. But what it does is it removes the, the principal's ability to choose for themselves who they want to be making a healthcare decision. And it, and it can also leave people out of the decision-making process that might otherwise um, be an integral part of that decision. For example, um, the, the priority that's in the statute gives priority to a spouse or to an adult child, but it, it kind of skips over significant others or partners. And um, so I think, again, <clears throat> the overriding theme here is that we want people to plan ahead and we want people to say ahead of time who it is that they want to be making decisions for them if they're unable to do it. And the statute really um, takes away that personal decision making um, because you might choose a family friend or uh, you might choose a professional to make healthcare decisions for you and those sorts of individuals are left out of that statute. So again, I can't stress enough how important it is to address these issues before you're in that crisis stage. Denise, I wanted to skip slide nine for now and go to slide 10, and then we'll, we'll come back to nine in, in just a moment. Um, because what I wanna do at this point is sort of transition over to talk to you about general uh, powers of attorney. So if we, if we go to 10, that would be great. And then I'll circle back here to legal capacity in a moment. Uh, I wanna talk just for a moment about a general power of attorney and what that allows um, the agent to do. Uh, again, as, we meant, as I mentioned at the beginning, a general power of attorney allows an agent to transact um, financial or business or legal um, issue uh, transactions for the principal. Um, our state statute uh, lists a number of general powers that an agent will have uh, on behalf of a, a principal. And those general powers have to do with real estate, um, stocks and bonds and investments, um, banking powers, um, insurance powers, um, estate and trust powers, but but general is the important word there. An agent would have general authority over the principal's um, financial affairs, but there are many issues that our state law says, if you are going to give an agent um, some kinds of authority, it, they have to be specifically mentioned in the power of attorney. We call those specific powers of attorney, and they include things like um, making a gift, on behalf of the principal or um, entering into a trust agreement or transferring um, property into a trust on behalf of the um, principal or changing a beneficiary designation under a life insurance policy on behalf of a principal. We call those specific authorities and they do give the agent a very broad uh, power, they give the agent very broad and very comprehensive powers um, over the principal's financial affairs. That again is an issue that the principal needs to carefully think about um, and needs to decide if those are um, issues related to their affairs, uh, if they're necessary or not necessary and why you might want an agent to have that very broad um, list of powers. I can think of lots of instances where I would want my agent to be able to have specific powers to make gifts on my behalf or to change a beneficiary designation for me. But what's very critical in 
bestowing that authority on an agent is that you trust your agent, that you trust your agent to do what is best for you and not, um, and not to be swayed by um, other family members or uh, not to be swayed by their own self-interest. A very critical piece of advanced planning is to choose your agent um, carefully, to choose an agent that you trust to act in your best interest that will not abuse their authority and, uh, will, not, um, and will do what you would have wanted them to do. Um, I wanna go back at this moment, um, Denise, if you don't mind, to that earlier slide, to slide number nine and talk about the, um, what, how, what is the degree of capacity that someone needs to have in order to sign a power of attorney. Our New Mexico law says that the, the capacity, the mental capacity sufficient to sign a power of attorney is the same as that is which is required to enter into a contract. And what that means is that the principal understands the nature and effect of the document that they're signing. That's pretty subjective. It's sort of one of those things where I'll know it when I see it, but it's not an, an objective definable uh, standard. So what it does require is meeting, in my opinion, is meeting with a lawyer and the lawyer going over and explaining the terms of the power of attorney and um, assuring themselves that their client understands what they're signing and is making a good decision in terms of the uh, amount of authority they're giving their agent and who their agent is. Are they choosing someone that they can trust? Are they choosing someone who can um, act in their best interest? Our New Mexico law also says that power of attorney can be signed legally, validly in a lucid moment. And lucid moment really means that a principal may have a diagnosis of dementia or Alzheimer's disease or something of that nature. But if at the time they're discussing and signing that power of attorney, they understand what they're signing. Um, it, it's a valid legal document because they have signed it in a moment where they understand what they're signing. And that becomes important because many people who have dementia or who have some kind of cognitive impairment you know, they have good days and bad days. And um, in given the current state of our law, if a principal signs a document at a time when they are having a good day, when they're understanding what they're signing, then it's a valid document and not invalid because later on down the road, they become incapacitated or don't remember what they sign. Um, Denise, if we could go to, um, uh, I think what we need to do at this point is go to um, slide number 13. And I just wanna, before I talk um, about um, other estate planning tools, I just wanna um, make a couple of general comments about powers of attorney. This slide is talking about a living will, which we've talked about already in terms of an advanced directive. But I want to just raise a couple of issues that have to do with all kinds of powers of attorney, and I think are really important for us to think about as we're doing advanced planning. And one of those important issues is that the power of attorney and the authority conveyed to the agent in the power of attorney is always subject to the principal's consent. A power of attorney does not allow an agent to um, it, to do something on behalf of the principal that the principal will not allow them to do. This comes up pretty commonly in um, uh, when it comes to maybe, for example, placement in some kind of residential facility. Um, a, a healthcare power of attorney does allow an agent to sign those admission documents and to place an individual into an assisted living facility or a nursing facility. However, if the principal says, I don't want to move into that assisted living facility for whatever reason, they don't think it's necessary, they don't like that facility, they're not ready for that. If the principal is saying, I, I refuse 
to go move into an assisted living facility. The agent does not have the authority to force that. So when the principal is incapacitated, that can become a real issue. And we work on that issue on a regular basis in our practice. That then requires the appointment of a guardian or a conservator, which is what Peggy's gonna talk to you about in just a few minutes. Um, so the principal always uh, retains the ultimate control under a power of attorney. A power of attorney is not effective if the principal is saying, no, I don't want that. And the agent is saying, yes, you will. When that happens, when, that, when we reach that impasse, the power of attorney really isn't an effective way of transacting whatever business that may be. Powers of attorney are always revocable, meaning the principal always has the authority to revoke the power of attorney and take all of the authority away from the agent. If the principal is incapacitated, then again, we have an issue, we have an impasse, and we're probably going to have to move toward guardianship and conservatorship. Um, there are so many issues that we could talk about relative to powers of attorney and family dynamics and exploitation by an agent. Um, those are always issues that uh, we would be discussing and dealing with in our practice, but um, a little bit outside the scope of this particular um, presentation. Abuse by agents using a power of attorney in a, in a, a wrongful or improper way it is, a, is a big issue in our legal practice and a big issue in society in general, and it's something that we always have to guard against. And again, the careful selection of your agent is what really is um, critical to um, effective planning using a power of attorney. Uh, I can't stress it enough. And, and that's why, again, I think it's really important as you're doing this advanced planning for yourself or for a loved one, that you consult with professionals, um, that you have a, an independent lawyer out there or some other care manager or someone who can tell you, hmm, maybe the person you're selecting as the agent isn't the best choice. And maybe you should consider some of these other choices. Um, the, the remaining slides in our program deal with um, estate planning tools, wills, and trusts. And um, I, I, I don't think I'm going to address this. I want to give Peggy time to talk to you about guardianship and conservatorship because those are, are very important issues today. So um, maybe another time we could talk about wills and trusts. Um, at any rate, I'm going to turn this over now to Peggy to talk about protective proceedings. If there are any questions for me, we can go over those at the end, I think, um, or maybe do that in some sort of chat fashion. But um, thank you for uh, listening to me today. And, um, and this is Peggy Graham, um, and she's gonna take it from here. Thanks, Marcy. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having us today. Um, just to eliminate the first question and confusion, Margaret and Peggy is all me. I blame my parents, they did that to me. Um, but you are, you are viewing the right person for this presentation. As Marcy said, we're gonna talk more about guardianships. And I know that can be kind of a scary, uh, scary concept for a lot of people. Denise, if you wanna go ahead and move to slide 17, that would be fantastic. Several years ago, there were a lot of articles in the Albuquerque Journal and there was a lot of discussion and, and um, concern about the guardianship process in New Mexico. And part of what, what concerned me as a practitioner is those articles um, weren't exactly on target as far as what a typical guardianship looks like. Um, that was an extreme case. And I, get, I had a lot of clients, a lot of individuals in the community asking me about guardianship and, oh my gosh, this is really scary and I want to make sure that never happens to me. It's important to keep in mind that guardianship really is a last resort. Uh, we, we absolutely want to try to help people with powers of attorney and lesser restrictive measures as much as possible. The courts, when looking at making uh, appointments for a guardian and conservator, want to, um, to ensure that the attorneys and the professionals involved are exploring all of the, the least restrictive measures to address the needs of an individual before we jump to the level of a guardianship and conservatorship. And I'm gonna explain as I go through this a little bit why that is such a deal uh, as it is. So you're gonna hear the words guardianship and conservatorship, and I tend to kind of shortcut that into guardianship, 
but a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is uh, relevant to both and applies to both things. The slide says that guardianship is sometimes called conservatorship, and in different states, there's different names for these types of protective proceedings. In New Mexico, we define protecting of the person, their physical health, their cognitive, their, their um, medical care, their, um, in, their prescription care, their medications, um, all of those doctors, hospitals, all of those physical care things, where somebody lives, what their nutritional status is, all of that is addressed by a guardian. They're in, con, they would be in charge of the person themselves. A conservator is someone who's in charge of the, the finances, the real property, the investments, all of the money type related things. So in New Mexico, we have two different systems and sometimes we only need a guardianship and sometimes we only need a conservatorship. Sometimes we need both. It just depends upon the circumstances that the individual may find themselves in. A lot of times, uh, especially with older folks that have had a successful career, they may have created a trust during their estate planning and all of their assets are in a trust, in which case we have a trustee who's gonna manage their assets and we don't necessarily need a conservatorship for them to make decisions. Sometimes we have individuals who are perfectly capable of um, making uh, healthcare decisions, but their understanding of the finances are more difficult, in which case we don't need a guardianship, but we may need a conservatorship. So we need to look at each case individually to determine what is actually necessary for an individual person. So what does the process look like? What happens if somebody needs a guardian or a conservator? Typically a client will come into our office and they'll be talking to us about concerns for a loved one that maybe they're not paying their bills or they're missing medical appointments. They don't remember what medications they're taking. Um, they're having difficulty keeping track of whether they've had a meal or not uh, that particular day. And we talk a lot about um, whether they're able to make decisions or whether they're able to make lower level decisions such as what do I wanna eat? Where do I wanna go uh, on a social outing? But maybe not more complicated decisions about what a, a medical procedure may, what the risks and benefits may look like. And we talk a lot about what their loved one is able to do and, and kind of what their diagnosis may be. As Marcy pointed out, it's always better if we can get into these situations earlier rather than later. We would absolutely rather have the ability to, uh, to help somebody with a, with a power of attorney and get that done. It, it's much quicker, it's much less expensive. And it allows the individual to choose the person who's going to be the decision maker, their agent for them. If the capacity is such that they're no longer able to make that decision, and sometimes when I have my young adults that are turning 18 with developmental disabilities, they came to us without the ability to, uh, to execute a power of attorney. And so we don't really have a whole lot of choices. But typically, you know, older adults who have lived a life and, and worked and raised a family and uh, been uh, productive members of the community, there was a time or has been a time that they're able to make their own decisions. And that would be the time obviously to work on powers of attorney and other estate planning documents. But sometimes um, that isn't possible or that's not working. Uh, as Marcy indicated, powers of attorney are revocable and you only need a lucid moment to execute them. And sometimes we have families that um, when mom comes to son's house, she's does okay for a while and he has her sign a power of attorney for him. And a month later, mom goes over to daughter's house and she's has a good day and daughter has her sign a power of attorney and we get into this kind of cycle thing. In those cases, we need to look to some other mechanism to make sure that mom's uh, mom, uh, is being looked after and that decisions are being made properly for her. And so guardianship and conservatorship may be where we, we look at that point. Other times um, an individual simply has, has kind of crossed the threshold of capacity and they're not able to make those decisions. When we determine that guardianship and conservatorship is the step that we need to take, and we do, I, you know, I, I know I do and Marcy does and the other attorneys in our office, we talk quite a bit with our clients about whether this is the route that we need to go if there's something else we can do. But if it's, there isn't anything else, here's kind of what happens. We start with a petition. And it's a petition is, is basically um, a pleading, a document that we file with the court that says to the court, hey, this is what's going on. This individual is not able to make decisions on their own anymore um, because of a medical reason. There needs to be an underlying medical reason, whether it's Alzheimer's, dementia, traumatic brain injury, stroke, developmental disability, there's gotta be something there. 
um, this individual can't make decisions anymore and so we need to put someone in place who's going to be able to make decisions on their behalf. That document informs the court as to who the individuals are that are primary um, important people in that person's life, such as a spouse, children, sometimes uh, siblings, other individuals that have a close relationship with that, that person so that the court knows who all the people that are maybe involved or maybe bringing information to the court are. That document also asks the court to appoint somebody to serve in the role as the guardian and or conservator. That could be the person who's, who's filing the petition or it may not be. Sometimes people file the petition asking for somebody else to serve in that role. Sometimes that happens if there's not a family member or close friend who is able to, to do that. Uh, to serve in that role and so they but they may be willing to put, ask the court to appoint someone and we may look to a professional or some other individual to serve. The important thing is we've got to get that document in front of the court to let the court know that this is what we need to have happen and that we need to get this going for the for the individual. Typically shortly after uh, the petition is filed the court will issue a couple of different documents to us to address. One is the notice of hearing and rights. This is a really important document. This is what we provide to the, what we call the alleged incapacitated person or the AIP. This, this document tells the person that there's going to be a hearing. They're absolutely entitled to notice. This is not ever something that is done behind closed doors without the involvement of the alleged incapacitated person, without the knowledge and involvement of close family members we absolutely want to make sure that everybody is aware of what's going on and has an opportunity to fully participate in the process. So this notice is provided to the alleged incapacitated person along with a copy of the, of the petition so that they know what is being alleged. And we have to assure the court with a, a specific filing, a notice of filing that the individual, the alleged incapacitated person has received uh, that information. The court also provides or, or appoints, excuse me, a guardian ad litem, a court visitor, and a qualified healthcare professional. These individuals have important but different roles in the process. As I said, there has to be an underlying medical basis for the need for a guardian and conservator. We don't just do guardians and conservatorships because we don't like decisions that mom or dad are making. Uh, everyone has the right to make really bad decisions. If, if we choose to do that and we understand the consequences and the, and the implications of it, we're allowed to do it. The United States is, uh, well, we hope is still a free country. And uh, if you're over the age of 18, you're considered uh, having capacity and can make your own decisions. So if, as long as we can determine what that underlying met, uh, medical condition is, we can move forward. And so the qualified healthcare professional is somebody who's gonna report to the court as to what that underlying condition is. Again, it could be uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, it could be stroke, brain injury, developmental disability, whatever it may be, that individual has is going to prepare a report to the court. A lot of times that individual can be a primary care physician, somebody who has known the, the alleged incapacitated person for a, a number of years mm -hmm. and is able to, to attest to the court that this is what's been going on with them. Sometimes we have a specialist involved that may a neurologist or, or a geriatrician who may be able to do that for us. If not, we do have uh, in, in Albuquerque, particularly and around the state, a number of incredibly experienced and well-qualified forensic psychologists who will sit down with the individual and uh, conduct an, an evaluation to determine their level of capacity and report to the court as to the need for a guardian and conservator. So that's one individual that we need to, uh, that the court will appoint. The other is a court visitor. This individual is someone with a social work background typically. He or she will assess the, the individual. They will meet with them. They'll meet with their family. They'll meet with the petitioner. They'll meet with the person or people who are proposed to be the guardian and conservator. And they'll make a report to the court as to whether they believe the individual is incapacitated and in need of a guardian and conservator whether they, um, the person who's proposed to serve in that, that role or those roles is appropriate to serve and anything else that they believe that is necessary for the person in their best interest from a social uh, services type aspect, whether they, their housing is adequate, whether their nutrition is adequate, if there's other services that they may need, they report to the court on those issues. 
the last person that the court will appoint is called a guardian ad litem. The guardian ad litem is uh, an attorney and they are again appointed by the court and their role is somewhat similar to the court visitor but not exactly the same. The guardian ad litem is in some respects the voice of the alleged incapacitated person. They will also interview that person, interview the proposed guardian and conservator, interview other family members or important individuals in that person's life and make an assessment again as to whether they believe the guardianship is necessary and if so is the proposed person the appropriate person to serve. They also will report to the court what the alleged incapacitated person wants, what we call their stated position, what they think and what they're asking and what, what position they may have. Sometimes that's not what's in the individual's best interest. On occasion, we've had folks that may have become very attached to somebody who is exploiting them, either financially or otherwise. And it's not necessarily in that person's best interest to remain with somebody who's being exploitive. So the guardian ad litem will inform the court of that as well and say, you know, your honor, my, my client really wants to stay with her nephew um, and live with him and let him to make, make continue to make decisions for her. But we have found that he has been taking money from her, her bank accounts and not taking her to the doctor when she needs to and is not providing appropriate care for her. And we, and as her attorney, I don't think it's in her best interest for him to continue in that role. So as a guardian ad litem, there's kind of that, that double, double side to presenting not only what the individual wants, but also what we believe is in their best interest. And ultimately the court makes the decision. And as it says here on the slide declared by the court, ultimately the only person who can determine that somebody is incapacitated and appoint a guardian and conservator is a court. Nobody else can do that. After this process, so as I said, the first step is the petition. The individual is notified of the hearing and their right to attend, their right to have witnesses testify, their right to cross-examine witnesses, their right to, um, to bring their own documents and evidence, and including their right to get their own attorney. The alleged incapacitated person is entitled to hire an attorney if they choose to do that and have that person advocate and represent them as well. Once all of the, that information has been disseminated and all the professionals have done the reports. They submit those reports to the court and to other individuals and we have a hearing. Now lately, these hearings have been uh, by Google Meets and by Zoom and other um, electronic type devices or platforms, which um, is difficult in some respects, but I will say is also somewhat a positive thing. Uh, I, I had a case not too long ago with a gentleman who was at the Veterans Administration Hospital and due to his uh, physical illness, as well as his cognitive capacity, he was not able to leave the facility, COVID notwithstanding. He had medical conditions that it was not safe for him to be transported away from the hospital. So if we had an in-person hearing at the courthouse, he would not have been able to attend. The courts really frown on that. Um, they really want the alleged incapacitated person in court. And if there's a reason for them not to be we have to address that with the court prior to the hearing and make the judge aware of that and get permission from the judge for that individual not to be there. It is a really, really big deal for the alleged protected, alleged incapacitated person not to be present for a hearing. So in this case, because we were in the time of COVID and we were doing everything electronically, we were able to set up the client with a social worker at the VA hospital to get him on the Zoom call. And he was able to fully participate just like the rest of us on the Zoom call. So technology sometimes actually can work out to be a good thing. But as I said, it's very important that the alleged incapacitated person is actually at the hearing and that courts make, uh, make us really work hard to prove that there's a reason for them not to. And that's a good thing. It's important that that individual be able to be present and be able to participate. So when the, when the court appoints a guardian and or a conservator, that individual does assume total responsibility for the person. That doesn't mean they assume total liability for the person. And sometimes people get really concerned about that and what that difference means. A guardian, once appointed, steps into the shoes of that individual and they have total authority to make any and all decisions regarding the health and care of that individual. As Marcy was talking about earlier, with a power of attorney, if a person has capacity, the agent doesn't get to just decide to move them into a, a nursing home or assisted living without their permission and their agreement. With guardianship, the guardian does have that authority. 
even if the alleged incapacitated person does not want to go into a facility, does not want to move out of their home or does not want something to happen, if the guardian determines that's what's in their best interest, the guardian gets to make that decision. So the guardian has the authority to move somebody into a different home or a different residence. The guardian has authority to hire and fire caregivers or care providers. The guardian has authority and must attend uh, medical appointments with the individual and has the authority to consent or not consent to medical treatment, to testing, to surgeries, to procedures, all of those things that the individual would have done, medications, all of that. That individual has the ability and the right to make those decisions for that person. On the conservatorship side, once a conservator is appointed, they have to, or they get to, or they will be making all of the decisions financially. They'll be the one to decide uh, if mom's home is going to be sold. If um, they need to make, they'll be the one that pays the bills and is responsible for, for doing those things. They'll be the one that makes the decision as to uh, how investments are handled and whether CDs are cashed out or rolled over. Um, all the things, the financial decisions that an individual would make for themselves, the conservator is now going to make. That again, that doesn't mean that they're liable for the alleged incapacitated person's actions or for their situation. A conservator is not personally responsible to pay the debts of the incapacitated person. So if someone takes over as conservator and uh, mom or dad has, has um, generated a, a huge credit card bill um, by shopping online or shopping on, on the QVC or one of those things, the conservator and the guardian, neither one of them is personally responsible for paying those bills. If um, mom or dad is, is behind on their mortgage and there's a foreclosure action, neither the guardian nor the conservator is personally liable for paying that mortgage and, um, and being personally liable on the foreclosure. The conservator would have to step in and, and deal with that on behalf of the incapacitated person, but they're not personally liable for those sorts of things. Again, as it says, a diagnosis of dementia alone is not sufficient to obtain a guardianship. D d uh, dementia and Alzheimer's, as we all know, is a progressive, uh, they're progressive diseases and they take time um, in different levels, different people, it progresses at a different rate. And so we highly encourage folks if they do get an early diagnosis or early on in the diagnosis that they meet with their attorney and work on getting these documents in place for powers of attorney and advanced directives while they have the capacity to do that. Once that, that disease process has traveled down the road far enough and the decisions can't be made, that's when we need to step in with the guardianship if we don't have those other documents. But just saying that, oh, I have a diagnosis of dementia does not automatically mean that you have to have a guardian. And if you have powers of attorney in place and they're working, then a diagnosis of dementia or Alzheimer's also does not necessarily require a guardianship. We have to make sure that the capacity level is appropriate. A couple of things that um, I think are important to remember about guardianship and conservatorship in general, once the, they are established, that incapacitated person is now subject to the court and is, it is going to be overseen by the court for their lifetime. A lot of times when we think about court cases, they have pretty definitive ending times. If you have a personal injury suit, if you're in a car accident, once you either settle or have your trial and uh, there's a ruling as to who's responsible for what, that case is over. If it's a criminal case, once a person is either found not guilty or they are found guilty and sentenced, th that case is over. That's not how it happens with guardianship and conservatorship. These matters remain open with the courts until the person either dies or leaves the state. And so that can be a very, very long time in a lot of cases, especially when we have younger folks that need guardianship or conservatorship for some reason. Those cases can remain open for years and years and years. One of the problems that we had in the past was that sometimes those cases got lost in the shuffle and they, they didn't come to the court's attention for review and they kind of got, um, got forgotten in some cases. The courts have been working incredibly hard over the last couple of years to make sure that that doesn't happen going forward and that all these matters are caught up. In, in Bernalillo County, the court has hired two special masters 
And these individuals primarily are responsible for going out and checking on all the existing guardianship cases in Bernalillo County and making sure that everything is still okay, that these individuals are still doing well, they're still alive, because that happened, this happened a couple times, we didn't know that someone had passed away, um, but their job is to, to get these things all caught up and on track. The guardian and a conservator are under the jurisdiction of the court as long as they're serving for this person, which means the court is overseeing what they're doing and how they're doing it from day one till the end, till the person moves or dies. It's important for someone taking on the role as a guardian and conservator to understand that not only are they required to report to the court annually, they're both required to first report to the court within 90 days. There's a special form that they need to fill out and provide to the court to give the court kind of a stat, initial baseline status of where things are. The conservator has to file an inventory so the court knows a basic a baseline um, where the individual's finances are at that point. And then from then on, every year on the anniversary of their appointment as guardian and conservator, they have to file a report with the court that tells the court what's going on with that person. Have there been any changes? Uh, are there improvements? Have they declined? Are they needing different services? Have they moved to a different place? Have they had any medical changes going on? Have they had any financial changes? Has there been anything new or different that's happened with their, with their assets? Have they sold a property? Have they bought into an annuity? What, what has happened with that individual over the year? And the courts are reviewing those. And when the courts have questions, they're setting a hearing and they're bringing everybody into the courthouse and saying, well, to the, to the Google meet at these days, but they're bringing everybody together and saying, hey, what's going on? The other thing that uh, individuals need to remember is that any interested person can bring a concern to the court at any time. New Mexico defines interested person incredibly broadly. This can be a doctor, this can be a neighbor, this can be the postal worker who keeps bringing Amazon packages over thinking, why are we ordering so much? What's going on here? This can be someone, uh, a banker who's wondering about what's going on with an individual's, uh, why, why changes are happening to their accounts. So any interested person can contact the court, including the incapacitated person. And all it takes is a letter. It doesn't have to be anything formal. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. It doesn't have to be anything from a judge. A letter to the court saying, hey, I'm concerned because this is going on. I'm not sure what, what's, if it's right or wrong, but I have a concern. If you send that to the court, the judge will set a hearing, bring everybody in and say, hey, let's talk about this and figure out what's going on. And if there's a problem, the judge, the court will address it. So just because you walk out of court uh, after your hearing, it's not over and you're not uh, without the support and the ability to go back into the court for problems or for simple questions. Sometimes guardians and conservators get into a position and they, they're not really sure what the right thing to do is. When, there's, when they get into those situations, they can go back to the court and say, hey, I just want some direction on what what I should do with in this particular case. The court is there as a support to help and maintain and guide the process. So guardians and conservators and the protected people are not just left to their own uh, and to struggle and to not know what, what they should be doing going forward. These proceedings are not closed. They're not sequestered anymore. They used to be, and there were only certain things that people that the general public could access. That has changed, and so it's important to remember that documents that are filed with the court, other than the qualified healthcare professional report and reports that have protected health information, those are still confidential, but everything else is open to the public. And so it's, again, we're not doing this in the shadows. We're not doing anything behind closed doors. Uh, we want to make sure that not only the incapacitated person, but all of their it, their family members and their close friends and relatives can be um, can be have access to what's going on with them. Um, if you want to serve as conservator for a family member in uh, in New Mexico, you must now be bonded. Sometimes this is difficult if you've had a bankruptcy or other financial problems in your background. Getting a bond is is can be difficult. We've had some cases of, of, of um, conservators and other people in positions of fiduciary responsibility and trust that have taken advantage 
and the courts are, have basically said enough's enough. We're not even going to take people's word that I'm a family member. I would never do that. So even if you are a family member, if you're going to serve as conservator and you're going to be in charge of your family member's money, if your family member has more than $30,000 in total assets, you will be required to obtain a bond. So keep that in mind as you're thinking about who should serve in that role and who might be eligible or ability to serve. The reports that guardians and conservators need to file with the court can be found on the court's website. Any attorney who practices in this area can also help with those reports and, and get you access to those. Technically under New Mexico law, powers of attorney are not automatically revoked when a guardianship and conservatorship is entered. More often than not, we do include that as part of our order of the court at the time because um, it can be confusing and difficult for healthcare providers or financial institutions to really understand who they're supposed to be working with and who they're dealing with. Guardians also have the right to restrict visitation with family members or friends or other close individuals. If that person is putting the incapacitated individual at risk, there are rules uh, in, our, in our statute about how that happens and when that can happen. And if that's something that you as a guardian or conservator are struggling with and there, you have a concern about somebody um, being a problem for your, your family member, then I suggest that you speak with an attorney about how you can go about getting restricted visits with those individuals. The most important thing to remember about guardianships and conservatorships is that it doesn't have to be scary. It doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be a bad thing. It can be a very, very good thing. It needs to be done properly. It needs to be done with the right professionals and it needs to be done with the right transparency. And with all of those things in place, it can be a good thing and it can be a positive thing for an individual and for their family. Typically, it takes about 60 to 90 days from the date that we file the petition before the before we have a hearing and have the appointments. So that's kind of the time frame that you're looking at for those. Um, as far as guardianships and conservatorships, that's kind of that's the process generally and the things to be most uh, to be looking at. We have a couple more slides that I want to touch on just very very brief briefly. Denise, if you want to move to slide 18. Um, Again, legal planning for all couples, whether you're married, whether you're domestic partners, um, same-sex marriage, it doesn't matter. It's important that you have these things in place and uh, we make sure that we're making decisions that are helpful for each other and helpful for ourselves uh, going forward. If you're an unmarried domestic partner, uh, next slide, make sure you have access to documents um, very frustrating, and this is not necessarily for unmarried domestic partners. This is for everybody. Mom or dad does a fantastic estate plan, and they don't bother to tell anybody where their documents are. And then there, it comes time for a power of attorney to act, and they don't have, and they can't find the documents. We don't know where those are. So make your wishes known to your family, to your physicians, and make sure your agents under your powers of attorney and the personal representative of your estate knows where your documents are. And let, you don't have to give them to them, but they got to know where they are. If they can't find them, they can't work them. And then if you want to move to slide 20, very briefly, as we're getting close to the end of our time, um, absolutely make sure you have all of your documents in one safe place. I always suggest to my clients that they go to Walmart and maybe purchase a $50 fire safe. Important documents in a safe deposit box or with access to that box. If there's nobody else that has access to the box, it doesn't do us a whole lot of good to have their documents in a place where we can't access them. We can get a court order to drill the safe, but that becomes a whole other impediment to getting things done. So make sure you keep your, your state planning and important documents in a safe place. Mm -hmm. Make sure other family knows where know where that safe place is and have access to them in case we need them in an emergency. And make sure that you keep everything updated. Um, again, if you're if you've named your uh, spouse as your as your agent, your power of attorney, and your spouse predeceased you, and you haven't named anybody else, again, that's not going to be particularly helpful, and it may cause us to need to do a conservatorship and a guardianship. So make sure that you're updating your documents when you have major life changes or if you have younger, you know, you know, young kids, once they become adults, they may want to take the place of, of other older individuals who may not survive you or may, yeah, may not survive you. Um, do it yourself. Ugh. 
I don't like that. <laughs> doing, doing it yourself can be, um, it, it can work. I'm not going to say that it doesn't necessarily work, but you need to be very, very careful that you're, you're getting documents that are appropriate for New Mexico. Um, some, I've seen documents that just simply require people to check boxes or fill in blanks. And sometimes with copying, um, we get smudges or different things and it's hard to tell if someone has marked that box or if it's just a smudge. Um, I've also seen people start putting things into documents that shouldn't be in the documents. Um, they're putting will type language and powers of attorney and vice versa. Um, I highly suggest that you just um, bite the bullet and hire an attorney to help you with the process. It's a whole lot cheaper to do it right the first time than it is for us to try and fix the mess after the fact. And um, attorneys will help you walk you through what you actually need. I can't tell you how many times people come to me and say they need a trust. And we talk about their estate plan and we talk about what they want and we talk about how they want their, their assets to go. And they don't need a trust. The, a simple will and uh, doing other estate planning tools will accomplish what they want without the expense of a trust. And uh, sometimes trusts become more complicated. There are absolutely reasons to do that. But again, it's something that is really best decided and dealt with with an attorney rather than, um, than trying to go into some other me mechanism. Um, doing it yourself is great for home improvement projects, but I wouldn't suggest it for medical or legal matters. So I think that is the end of our time today. I'd be happy to an answer any questions anybody may have. We do have a few. Um, we have a little bit of time to just run over maybe a few minutes, but um, does the state of New Mexico legally recognize five wishes documents? And then there's a second part that says, it is my understanding that all power of attorneys terminate when the patient loved one expires or dies. Is that correct? Well, I'll take the second one and I'll let Marcy take the first one. <laughs> so yes, a power of attorney dies with the individual. Um, and so does a guardianship. There's a conservatorship because there's assets that have to get transferred to a personal representative will survive a little bit longer until that is accomplished. But powers of attorney end at the death of the principal. And you, you no longer have authority to make decisions for that person once they have passed away. That is correct. Okay. And on the five wishes question, um, there isn't that I'm aware of any state law that says that they have to be um, recognized, but, but they are as a general practice recognized. I've, uh, you know, I've discussed them with clients many, many times. And um, in the medical field, I think they're quite, uh, quite readily accepted and recognized. So I think the answer is yes, but just not like on, based on an official statute or something of that nature. Okay. And then we have another question that says, um, a, a question I have is the family is a is, the family is power of attorney and due to safety and concerns, if the loved one refuses to go to assisted living, how does that work? Do I don't know. Want, <laughs> Nikki, do you want me to do that? Go ahead. I think we touched on that just a little bit earlier. Um, if the principal, you know, is incapacitated and not making a safe decision for him or herself in terms of um, not being safe at home and needing to go to assisted living and so is refusing. The agent does not have the authority to place the principal in a facility against his will. So that's an instance where we would have to go the guardianship route. Okay, um, there is another question that is, what does that mean bonded in New Mexico? So bonding means that you have to have um, so essentially an insurance policy is, a, is kind of another way to look at it. You have to get a policy with a company and uh, sometimes it's you know, State Farm and some of the, you know, your typical insurance companies will do this. There's other companies that specifically do bonds and basically you're, you're buying an insurance policy that if you take off and go on a vacation to Bora Bora with mom's money, um, there's, there's a, a, a fund there to protect her. So for example, um, if mom's estate is worth $500,000, the court will order the conservator to obtain a bond in the amount of $500,000. That means that you have to get an insurance policy 
for that amount so that if you as a conservator don't do your job and you run off with mom's money, she's not left completely destitute. The premium for that insurance policy is paid by the estate. So mom's funds will pay the premium for that policy, but the conservator has to be able to be bonded, which means they have to have um, a financial background that doesn't include, as I said, bankruptcies or other, pro or other financial um, convictions for, um, for fraud or theft or that sort of thing um, in order to be qualify to serve in that role. Okay, so we do have a lot of questions in the chat and unfortunately um, our, our meeting will have to end at this point, but um, if you guys are available, there are some chats, some questions on your speaker page. Um, if you would be able to access those and, and provide any answers for, for those individuals, it would be greatly appreciated. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, um, Mrs. Graham, Ms. Basinger for um, giving this information today. Um, you know, this is a resource that obviously everybody needs, you know, so I appreciate you spending your time with us today. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for having us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.